record here and expand. We have a little writing room. And I'll take a snapshot of it. Go ahead and start reading number three. Number of landscapes. These on our jobs. Okay. Okay. So what that means is that the cost of the job equals. $60 plus 12 times N times H. N is the number of landscapers. H is their total number of hours they're going to put in. What's the 12 going to be? So N is the number of landscapers. H is the total number of hours. Go ahead and read through the four answers. The company here is 12 per hour for each landscaper. A minimum of 12 landscapers will work on each job. The price of each job increases by 12 an hour. Each landscaper works 12 hours. I think it's A. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Okay. And remember, this is question three. This is not going to be that tough. Okay. In other words, if you have no landscapers at all, he's still going to charge you $60. It's a fixed $60 charge. But if yep. you have even one landscaper and they work one hour, then your price is going to be $72 because you're going to pay that landscaper 12 bucks per hour. Okay. Okay. Uh, hold on a second. That doesn't work. I forgot. I gotta manually go to four. All right. Number. Hold on a second. One second. Let me just check something here. No, we're in good shape. Let's do four. Get my name for the four plus four dollars. To the four is equivalent. Tell me what this means. Like what A means? No. Tell me what that expression means. It's the whatever's in the parentheses squared. So what is that asking me to do? Squaring it. Which means what? It means 3A squared plus 2B squared times itself, correct? Yeah. That's the key. You have to know what squaring means. Okay, now, if I were to square it, like it, in other words, one way I'm going to answer problem number four is by going through each of the answers and seeing if it, if it works. If I were to square this, do I get that? Okay, um. now, you don't have to do the complete math here. If I square that, what's the first term going to be? A. 
Oh, you're going to multiply right. that by that. Yeah. What is that? What's 3a squared times 3a squared? 9a to the 4th. Okay. So we know that has to be part of the answer. Correct? Yeah. Okay. Well, so far, a looks pretty good. Let's check some other answers. What is the first term in b going to be? I'm going to have 3a times 3a, which is 9a squared, times 3a times 3a. My first coefficient is going to be 81a to the fourth. Uh -huh. Well, we're not looking at that. We're looking at 9a to the fourth. So I immediately know that that one's wrong. Okay. If I square C, what is my first term going to be? Um, 81. To the fourth. Not 81a to the fourth. Okay. It tells me that's not it. Because I'm looking for something that says 9a to the fourth. Now, let's look at D. What is that first term going to be? 9a to the fourth. It's not 9a to the fourth. It's quantity 9a to the fourth. Oh. Which is going to be 9 times 9 times 9 times 9. That's not right either. The only one that even produces the correct first term is this A. I don't even have to go any further. In other words, I don't have to check this term here or this term here. This has to be the answer is... Um, A is the only one that produces that as a first term. And that's all you have to check. Okay. okay. All right. Sorry, I was late today. I kept looking at my clock that it's in military time, and it said 1530, and I kept translating that in my head as that's 230. <laughs> uh, it didn't occur to me until I got the e or the text from you that, oh, that is 330. <laughs> <laughs> no. no, I'm sorry. Um, You're good. Okay, so we're trying to solve number five. Now, we want to be aware that the numbers are going up. We know math goes from easy to hard. So we expect number five, they're going to start getting a little more difficult. One through four were all pretty easy. All right. So what's a good way to solve number five? Um, what is the value of K? Um, I don't know. Let's back saw it. Yeah. You know what I mean by back saw? I think so. Pick an answer. We're going to plug it in and we're going to see if it works. Okay. Where do you start? When you back solve a problem, which one do you start with? The smallest number. No, you actually start with either the second smallest or the second largest. Okay. I'm going to start with three. In other words, I am going to assume that K equals three. That's the answer. Hold on one second here. Hello? Sorry about that. Okay, so I'm going to choose k equal 3. They've told me that x equals 7. So the question becomes, is this a true statement? 2 times 3 squared, because they, I'm guessing that k is 3, plus 17 
minus, well, they told me x was 7. Is that a true statement? Well, if we do the math, 2 times 9 is 18 plus 2 times 9 is 18 plus 17. So the square root of 35 minus 7, is that equal to 0? No. What's that? No. No, it isn't. This has to be 49, right? Yeah. Okay. So that tells me a lot. One of the advantages of back solving is that it allows you to eliminate stuff. So if 3 is not correct, what else is not correct? 2. Wait, yeah. No, you're absolutely right. If I substitute 2 in there, I get a smaller number than 35. Remember, I need this number to be 49. Mm -hmm. Okay, so now is all i got to do is try one more number. I don't know if it's C or D, but whatever I try... It's going to give me the answer, okay? So okay. let's try C, okay? So now it's 2 times, and you can pick either one. doesn't really matter. The question is, is that an equation? Well, that's the square root of 2 times 16. 32 plus 17 is 49. Is that true? Yes. So that's our answer. And had that been too small, we would have been done. We would have known that D was the answer. So if I would have tried D instead of C, I would have gotten a number bigger than 49, and I would have known it was too big, had to be smaller, since it has to be bigger than 3 and smaller than 5, I would have known it was C. Now, the advantage in back solving problems is that you're virtually always guaranteed to only have to do two calculations, not more. Okay. Now, you don't have to back solve this, but let's just play around with if I tried doing it algebraically. Here's what I would get. I would move the x to the other side. That'd be my first step. And I would square both sides to get rid of the radical sign. So that would be my second step. And then you can see that the algebra gets really tough. You end up with k squared equaling x squared minus 17 all divided by 2. So k is the square root of all of that. Now i got to substitute 7 for x, so it's 7 squared. And that's what k is, is the square root of 7 squared minus 17 all divided by 2. And that answer is going to be 4. But you can see where the algebraic solution was a lot tougher, right? Mm -hmm. It's tougher to solve this than it is to test certain values for k and see if they're correct or not. Hold on a second. I apologize. I think that was my TV that came on. Let me go shut it off. Hold on. Sorry about that. I had paused my TV and after a half hour it comes off a of pause automatically and starts up again. So all right, let's go and let's do these in order. So let's do six next.
All right, six. We expect it to be a little harder still because we're going up. The further you go through a section, the harder they're going to get. When you start at a new section, like if they start in the grid ends or they start in the uh, no calculator or calculator used, it always starts over again in terms of degree of difficulty. Okay. Well, we're on question six of this group of questions. So I'm expecting it to get a little harder than what we have gotten up until this point. Now, they tell you that line L is parallel to line K. What is the value of that? Well, <clears throat> notice one thing. When you have parallel lines and a transversal, this is the transversal. Okay. With me? Mm -hmm. Well, geometry tells me that that angle is the same as that angle, correct? Yeah. Geometry also tells me that because that line is a transversal, that that line angle is equal to that angle. And I know that this angle is equal to that angle. So what do I have here? What kind of triangles? Acute angles? What kind of triangles? Oh, triangles. There's one triangle. Uh -oh. Another triangle. What is their relationship? They can either be congruent, they can be similar, or they can be neither. First of all, are they congruent? Are they exactly the same? No. Okay. Are they similar? Yes. Ah, because all three angles are the same. In other words, if that angle is equal to that angle, and this angle is equal to this angle, so all you actually need is two angles to be the same. Then this one here has to be equal to this one here. So I have all three angles are equal to one another. That makes them similar. Now, once you're dealing with similar triangles, you need to remember the pattern you use. The first thing you do is figure out what is the similarity ratio. Uh, In other words, take one side of one triangle and compare it to the same side of the similar triangle. What do you get? If I look at the big one compared, let's take that side right there. Mm -hmm. Compare it to this side right there. Those actually are the same sides. Those are uh, corresponding sides of similar triangles. What's the similarity ratio? How much bigger is this one than this one? Two times. Okay. Well, if that side is two times, then the difference between this side and this side has to be two times. What is P? Ten. You got it. That's how you do those. And it is all based on the fact that they were parallel. But expect that. If there is one thing the SAT is going to check you on, it's parallel lines. In other words, they're going to give you parallel lines, and they're going to give you at least one transversal. Sometimes they'll complicate it up and give you a second transversal and give you a problem that looks like that, just to confuse you a little bit. Okay? But the thing to remember is, is that if that line is parallel to that line, then these angles are the same. That angle is the same as that angle. Alternate interior. And this angle here 
is the same as this angle there. In other words, when you have two parallel lines and a transversal, you only create two angles. One of them is obtuse, the other one's acute. Okay. So the key thing here is knowing that every acute angle, not, not this one here, let me get rid of that line, but every acute angle produced in this is the same. Every obtuse angle is the same. In other words, angle 7 is an obtuse angle, right? Mm -hmm. That means it's the same as angle 2. Angle 1 is acute. Angle 2 is obtuse. Any other angle I find in here is one of those first two. This is acute, so 6 is the same as 1. Okay. All right. Go up back to seven. Now seven. The, the biggest difference between hard problems and easy problems in the SAT is the number of steps. Yeah. Okay. So I'm going to write something down over here. What would the answer to this be? Uh, would I just multiply the 7 and the 4? No, nope. you subtract them. 3. It's x to the third. Okay. So, you need to know your exponent rules. Let's go over them x to the a times x to the b. What do I do to the exponents? You subtract them. Add them. Add them. Because in this case, I'm doing multiplication. But if I had x to the a over x to the b, now I'm doing division. So what do I do with the exponents? What do you, uh... There is three exponential rules you've got to remember. The, the SAT loves to test you on them. What's that third one? Um, All three of these have one thing in common. The same base. In other words, there's the base. There's the base. There's the base. So the thing that you need to remember is that when you have the same base, you never do to the exponents what you're doing to the base. Well, in that example, I'm multiplying the base, so I'm never multiplying the exponents. I'm doing one level less. I'm adding them. Okay. When I am sub dividing the base, I am subtracting them. And when I am doing double exponentiation, which is actually single exponentiation, I am multiplying them. Okay? So those are your three rules. Memorize them. There will be a, a few problems on those. Okay. All right? Now, let's go ahead and finish this problem, and then I'll let you go. Uh, that should end up being about a half hour. So here I have x to the a squared divided by x to the b squared. And they're telling me that's equal to x to the 16th. Well, what is that equal to if I just use the variables? If you just did the variables, you would, wouldn't you subtract them? Okay, so it's x to the a squared minus b squared, correct? Yeah. That's equal to x to the 16th. Okay, not done yet. In fact, we've got a lot of work to do on this problem. That's the nature of the hard problems is it takes simple things that you should know about math and make sure you put them all together. 
Okay, so here I have this expression, right? What does that tell me a squared minus b squared has to be equal to? 6 x to the 16th. Good. Now it becomes a factoring problem. In other words, I still can't solve it yet, but I recognize difference of perfect squares. How does that factor? Um, a minus B times what? A minus B. A plus B. When you are factoring difference of perfect squares, it's always minus times plus. Okay. Okay. Now I'm down to this step. Now, if I look at the additional information they've given me, they tell me a plus b is 2, and they want to know what a minus b is. So what's, what's my next step? Putting the a minus b, put a number in for a minus b. A minus b is what I'm trying to solve for. a plus b is 2. That's all equal to 16. Now, if I divide both sides by 2, I get a minus b equals 8. That's the correct answer. Okay. Oh, that makes sense. Okay. Well, it shows you when they want to give you a medium hard problem, is all they're going to do is give you a problem that has multiple steps. In other words, we had to know our rules of exponents because we had to know that x to the a squared over x to the b squared was x to the a squared minus b squared. Well, and they've told us that that equals x to the 16th. Now we have to know that if I have x to one number equals x to another number, those two exponents have to be the same. So I get here, a squared minus b squared has to equal 16. And then I have to know my difference of perfect squares, how to factor that. I have to know that that's a minus b times a plus b. Once I get to that step, now I'm home free because they've told me what a plus b is. And what they're asking for is what is a minus b. So when I get to this step, it's easy. The problem is I had to go through three, and I'm not going to say difficult steps, because none of them are difficult. You need to know your rules of exponents, okay? So you need to know that that is x to the a squared minus b squared. you got to be able to go from that step to that step to even get started on this problem. And then you also have to know your difference of perfect squares. So, as I've noticed on these college board SAT tests, all of the hard problems are not hard problems, as what they are is they're set up, so you have to know three different things. Each of those three things are easy things. You've got to memorize those. But they put them all together when they give you a hard problem. Okay. Okay. Uh, it feels to me like we went about a half an hour. Does that feel about right for you? Yeah. Okay, so I'll make a note that we left off on 7, and we'll put, pick up there next time. And once again, I apologize for the delayed starting time. So good. <laughs> All right. Haley, I'll talk to you next time. Thank you. You're welcome. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.